Hello again, students. Back here with lesson three of unit eight, which is again about factoring, but this time with perfect square binomials. So hopefully by the end of this, we'll be able to factor a perfect square binomial with or without a uh, greatest common factor included. Jumping into it here. So this is an example of a perfect square binomial. And, and binomial, again, just means there's two terms here. Okay, obviously you see that there's really a 1x squared minus 36. And what makes it a perfect square binomial is 1 is a perfect square because the square root of 1 is 1. 36 is a perfect square because the square root of 36 is 6. So um, naturally 6 squared is 36 or 1 squared is 1. That's the idea of being a perfect square. Now, you notice here that there's no b term, which means that the sum of the two uh, terms uh, that we would have when we ultimately get down to the bottom here of an f of x and an x uh, and another x and again a plus minus scenario and again because this is a minus that means one of these has to be plus and one of them has to be minus. Now the other reason we know that is because the the two terms that would go right here and right here need to add up to zero. And so what we think about is okay what two terms add up to zero and are factors of the the, the value of 36, which again is the C. And again, the idea with the C is you have to multiply to be the C value. Well, when we look at the factors of 36, you've got 1 and 36, you've got 2 and 18, you've got 3 and 12, um, you've got 4 and 9, and you've got 6 and 6. Well, this is a standout here because, again, if we have to have a positive and have to have a negative, then to have an x plus 6 and an x minus 6, they would add up to 0, um, but would multiply to be negative 36. And so this is kind of the, the general routine that you'll see in these perfect square binomials is they're not going to have this b term, okay, that single x term, because that will always zero out. And the reason it's going to zero out is because we're going to have basically a positive and negative version of whatever the square root of c is. Um, in this case, the square root of 36 is 6. So we have a positive 6 and a negative 6. And that then would be the result. So our zeros here naturally would be um, a 6 and a negative 6 because we would uh, solve each one of these with the zero product property. So we'd have an x is negative 6 here, and we'd have an x that's 6 here. So moving forward, when we look at one like this, this is a 1 and a 1, okay? And again, the square root of 1 is 1. And so as we would solve this, it would again just be an x plus 1 and an x minus 1. Again, where if we foiled that, we'd have x squared. Outside would be minus 1x. Inside would be plus 1x. And last of 1 times negative 1 would be a negative 1. And you can see these two would add up to 0. Um, and so we just would end up with x squared minus 1 there, which, of course, is what we started with here. So again, as we, were, as we would solve for our zeros here, we'd have x plus 1 equals 0 and x minus 1 equals 0. So if we subtract 1 from both sides here, we've got x is negative 1 is one of our zeros, and x equals 1 is the other one, uh, solving for that quadratic. Another one here, so we've got a 9 and a 25. So again, now this is the first time that we've had an A term that's not 1. But in the same vein, it is a perfect square. Okay, the square root of 9 is 3, or 3 squared is 9. Square root of 25, of course, is 5, or 5 squared is 25. So what we're really looking at here is the idea of not just an x, but now a 3x. And again, this is a minus right here. So one of these would have to be plus, and one of them would have to be minus. And again, with the same sort of routine that we did on the previous two slides, these values would each be fives, because five times negative five is a negative 25. Now, when we FOIL, just to, to double check this, okay, first times first is 9x squared. So that's a check from right there. Uh, outside is a 3x times a negative 5, so that's a negative 15x. Inside is a 5 times a 3x, so that's a positive 15x. And then, of course, the last we already talked about is a minus 25. So the minus 15 and plus 15x 
means that that's a zero term in the middle, which is exactly what we saw right here. So again, our final answer here would be 3x plus 5 and 3x minus 5. Now with that, when we're solving for our zeros using that zero product property again, it would mean that either the first term has to be zero. Oops, sorry, this should read zero equals, not f of x equals. And our second term would have to be zero. Okay, so if we solve these now, keep in mind we're going to get a fraction. So 3x equals negative 5 divided by 3. So x equals negative 5 thirds. That's just fine to leave that as a fraction. Okay, obviously that's approximately negative 1.67, but you can see that when we left it as a fraction, we got to leave it with an equal sign. When we convert it to a decimal, it's just approximately equal. So if we can have the equal sign, we'll take it and just leave it as negative 5 thirds there. Here, adding 5 to both sides on the bottom, 3x equals 5, and you can see, oops, sorry, this is a 3. Our other 0 would then just be a positive 5 thirds. And this is common and not surprising that these end up being just uh, additive inverses of each other, meaning that combined, if you were to add them up, they're 0, but uh, uh, just a negative version of the of the positive five thirds. So, um, so those would be our two zero. Now here's just another similar one, um, but with forty nine and one hundred. So naturally, we're looking at with the square root of forty nine being seven and the square root of one hundred being ten. That would mean that we have f of x equals again a seven x and a seven x. One of them being a plus, one of them being a minus, and in this case, they're both tens. And again, if you foiled, you'd get 49x squared. Outside would be negative 70x. Inside would be positive 70x. And the last would be a negative 100. And again, the primary marker of these perfect square binomials is that those x terms offset. Um, it's a positive and negative version of the same value. Um, so you'd get the 49x squared minus 100. So we know we've done this correctly. Now to get the actual zeros here, again, we'd have 7x plus 10 equals zero. So subtract 10, we'd have 7x equals negative 10. And when you divide by seven, similar to the last slide, we'll just leave that as negative 10 sevenths. And then not surprisingly, the second one, 7x minus 10 equals zero. Now you're adding the 10 to both sides. And so 7x would equal 10. So x would equal a positive 10 sevenths. So again, these two just additive inverses of each other, um, a positive and negative version of 10 sevenths. Um, now this here, you can see has values that are not perfect squares, okay? The, the values here, 98, if you, if you take the square root of 98, it's not clean. If you take the square root of 200, it's not clean, but, if you look a little closer, what this really is, is the, the same problem we had on the last slide. You just would pull a negative two out. And what I mean by that is if I pull a negative two out, then not only do I make this a positive 49 X squared, but we also get back to this being a minus 100. Okay, because negative 2 times a negative 100 gets us back to that plus 200. So now we're back in that same format that we like to see in these perfect square binomials, which is a positive perfect square as the A term and a negative perfect square as the C term. So as we finish this, the rest of this looks exactly like we just did on the last slide. So there's a negative 2 there, but this is 7x minus 10 and 7x plus 10, which means the zeros here are exactly what they were on the last slide, okay? You can see factoring out or having that negative two that got factored out right away did not change anything about our zeros. So uh, x is still 10 sevenths or negative 10 sevenths just as we saw on the last slide. Okay, and again, it had one more step here of, of getting this um, negative two factored out up front, 
but everything else after that was exactly the same. And then we just always remember to keep that negative two in front if we were to write that full equation again at some point, um, even though we didn't utilize it over here at all. Um, that negative two is still every bit a part of the equation um, because the original function was negative 90. Okay, moving. So here's just another example. Um, we'll just factor on this one where again, the A term is 32, which is not a perfect square. The C term is 50, which is not a perfect square. But again, if we factor this, and if there were greater common factors that we would find, um, we'd still wanna be very mindful about it because in this case, pulling out a two, which does happen to be the greatest common factor, gives us the perfect squares we're looking for. Right? If we were to pull out, uh, if, let's say four went into 50, if we were to take out a four, getting an eight X squared would not be quite as advantageous for us in terms of trying to uh, use this model of, of factoring a perfect square binomial. So, um, so from here, again, following that same process that we followed, we'll have a four twelve or four X plus and a four X minus. And in this case, it's 25 that we're trying to get it to end up being. So these would be fives. And so again, the middle terms would be a negative 20 X and a 20 X. And, the, and so they would offset and we'd have a 16 X squared and a 25 uh, minus 25. And then we still have this two out here, which again is still every part of the equation. It's just not gonna be part of finding our zeros. So finding our zeros, which we won't actually solve here, um, would still be each of these equal to zero and we'd end up with five fourths and negative five fourths um, as, we, as we solve for those using the zero product property. Uh, and finally here, just one more. Um, what you see here is, again, a little bit of an issue where three is not a perfect square and neither is 75. But again, we can find a factor that works here. And the only reason I've added this one in here is because it's not just a two or a negative two to take out of here. Um, in order to get this A term, for the A being the three, in order to get that to a perfect square, we'd, we would need to get that down to a one. So in order to do that, We'd have to pull out a three. Well, if we pull out a three, then this becomes a 25. Um, since three times X squared is three X squared and three times the negative 25 would be a negative 75. That would work for us. And so when we factor this, we still would have that three out front. We'd have an X plus and an X minus. Again, there's nothing in front of the X's this time because it's just X squared, not four X squared or nine X squared or anything like that. And then these again would be fives in order to get that C term to be a negative 25. So our zeros here would be X plus five equals zero. So X being negative five would be one of our zeros and then X minus five equaling zero or X equaling five would be our other zero in this particular problem. Um, that again, the, the one difference pulling out a factor that's different than two, again, the factor could be anything. It could be 15 that we pull out of here. And so we just always have to be mindful of, is there something that we can factor out to, to lead in front of this parentheses here that would allow us to be working with only perfect squares within the parentheses? So uh, thank you very much for listening. And as always, if you have questions, please ask.